Welcome to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. As a veteran senior pastor, Dr. Sullivan understands the importance of Bible teaching in the spiritual growth and development of God's people. Dr. Sullivan's method of teaching the Bible is to read and carefully explain each chapter and verse in clear and understandable terms so the student of the Bible gains the full understanding of God's Word. Now prepare yourself to learn and grow as Dr. Sullivan teaches through the Bible. Well, hello and welcome to another session of Teaching Through the Bible. I'm Dr. Kenneth Sullivan. Well, today we're studying in the exciting book of Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And as usual, I'm reading in the New Living Translation. So let's just jump right into our study. Hebrew chapter 9, I'm reading verses 1 and 2. That first covenant between God and Israel had regu uh, uh, regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room were a lampstand, a table, and sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the holy place. Now, the writer takes the time to actually describe the, the tabernacle for worship under the old uh, covenant, the old system uh, on this earth that the, that the Jewish people followed. Now, God laid out the plans for this tabernacle to serve as a place of worship. Uh, the tabernacle was a tent. Uh, the fabric was, was made of a woven flax and goat's hair and had a covering of, of badger skins and ram skins and, and fine linen. And the tabernacle was 45 feet long by 15 feet wide uh, and 15 feet tall. So it was, it was sort of long and narrow. The tabernacle had two rooms in it. The first room was twice as large as the second room. It was uh, 15 feet by 30 feet, uh, and it was called the holy place. Now, only the priests were allowed to, uh, to enter this, this first room, um, and, and they went in every day to perform their, their priestly duties. The first room was, uh, it had two pieces of furniture in it. It had a, a lampstand that's also called a menorah, uh, and it had a table that had 12 loaves of bread on the table called showbread. And, and the priests were the only ones who were allowed to, to actually eat this bread, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel and how, how God um, uh, serves as their provider, how he is their uh, sustainer. So this, this tabernacle was this place of worship on earth where... Um, only the priests could go inside. Uh, uh, regular people could not enter in that. They could stay out in, out in the courtyard. They would come into the courtyard area, uh, but they could not enter into this tabernacle. The priests could go into this first room, the holy place. Now, this table in the holy place was uh, made of acacia wood, which was overlaid with gold. Uh, the lampstand or the menorah was made of uh of gold and it and it had um, a stem and six branches actually, which made up uh, seven a total of seven lamps. And uh, this lampstand uh, again was pure gold and it served as the only light in in the uh, in the tabernacle. Now I'm reading verses three through five. Then there was a, a curtain, and behind the curtain was the second room called the most holy place. In that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark were a gold jar containing manna, Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the Ark's covering, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail now. So uh, the writer of Hebrews is giving them a picture of the Ark uh, of, of the, actually the, the whole tabernacle, which uh, was under the old covenant. And he's going to make a comparison between the old and the new. Now, this second room in the tabernacle was, was half the size of the first room. Uh, it was a perfect cube. It was 15 feet uh, wide by 15 feet long by 15 feet high. And, and uh, some people believe that the New Jerusalem, which is uh, the city that's going to come down out, out of heaven, is a perfect cube. Uh, and that this uh, holy of holies, this uh, inner holy place, uh, actually, in a sense, represents the, the New Jerusalem. Now, it was called the most holy place or the holy of holies. 
It was separated from the first room by a very tall, thick uh, curtain or veil. You can see that, you can read about that in Exodus chapter 26. Now, the Holy of Holies contained the golden altar for burning incense, and it was made of acacia wood that was overlaid with gold. Uh, and it was uh, three feet high and one and a half feet uh, long by one and a half feet wide. Uh, and you can read about that in Exodus chapter 30, if you'd like. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was also inside the Holy of Holies. Um, it was a wooden chest that was overlaid with gold. It was um, three and a half feet long by about uh, two feet wide and two feet high. Um, it was like a chest. It had uh, rings built into it running along the side, um, and the rings were there to, to, for the poles to be inserted. There were long poles that were inserted into the rings, and the ark was carried by these long poles, uh, which um, uh, protected the priests who carried it from looking into the ark or from getting too close to it. So uh, you can read about that in Exodus chapter 25, uh, verses 10 and 22. Now, in Israeli history, there was a man named Uzzah who got too familiar with the ark, um, and he looked into it and he handled it, uh, and he was struck dead. So this uh, ark was really nothing to play with. The priests had to stay a distance from it, and the, the common people had to stay even a further distance from it when the Israelites were in traveling because it, it represented the, the presence of God, um, and it was sort of like the throne of God. It was the seat, uh, the mercy seat was a cover on top of it, uh, and so it was a very holy uh, article of furniture. Now, the ark contained a golden pot of manna. The manna was a reminder of uh, uh, to Israel of, of uh, how God took care of them and fed them during their wilderness journeys, um, the years that they were journeying through, journeying through the uh, wilderness. Now, the ark also contained Aaron's rod that had budded and blossomed uh, and sprouted almonds. It was a, it was a reminder uh, of the time during um, one of Israel's rebellions in the wilderness of how God uh, demonstrated um, that he had selected Aaron as his, uh, as his priest, as his leader, and given him the authority, okay? You can read about that in, in Numbers chapter 17. Now, the ark also contained the stone tablets of the covenant with the Ten Commandments um, that, uh, that God had written to, uh, for Moses to to share and to teach uh, the people by, the Ten Commandments on that stone tablet. Now, the lid of the ark was decorated with two carved cherubim, or angels, with their wings outspread, extended toward each other. Uh, the lid was called the mercy seat. It was where God's presence presided, and uh, it received the, the blood of the animal sacrifices. They were sprinkled on the mercy seat. Um, for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. And now uh, this was done on the Day of Atonement, and you can read about that in Exodus chapter 25. Now I'm reading verses 6 through 7. And these things were all in place. The priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. Now, the priests carried out their daily uh, religious duties in the first room of the tabernacle. They replenished the oil in the in the lamps, um, and they um, replaced the uh, the showbread with with the fresh bread, and and they may maintain the furnishing. So that was the priest. Uh, but they were not allowed. The the uh, the priests were not allowed to go into this second room. The uh, most holy place or the holy of holies. The, the priest could not go into it. Only the high priest, um, he was only, the only one uh, allowed to enter into this uh, most holy place, the holy of holies, uh, and he could only enter there once a year, uh, and then he had to come in with blood. He entered on the day of atonement, uh, and he had to come in with blood, which he offered for himself first, and then he offered for the sins of the people. Now, the job of the high priest was a stressful one because the Holy of Holies was a, was a frightening uh, place to serve. If the high priest failed to, to follow the instructions that God had uh, given to them,
he could be struck dead. Now, uh, Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, at the time when God was, was teaching them about this, the, the priesthood and establishing it, um, they did an unpardonable thing. They, they gathered fire in their censers and they offered strange fire to God. They violated the priestly order or, or the, uh, the details of how they were to do things and God struck them dead. So whenever the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, um, he was under stress because that was a historical moment that everybody remembered and nobody wanted to do the wrong thing. He wanted to make sure that, that um, he did everything just the way God told him to so he could walk out of there alive. Now, this was uh, how exacting and demanding the old covenant law was, and God wants to make this clear to us. Now, the Day of Atonement was set aside specifically to address the sins uh, that the people committed in ignorance. Uh, the sins they knew about were addressed in the daily sacrifices and the sin offering that were brought to the priests uh, and, and were offered up to God. But uh, being human, there were sins that they knew about and there were sins that they committed without knowing it. And then on the Day of Atonement, um, those sins were addressed. Now I'm reading verses 8 through 10. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offered are not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. Now, the writer... Uh, has to help the Hebrew saints see that this whole uh, system of worship, the tabernacle, the animal sacrifices, and all the ceremonies connected to it was designed only to be temporary. None of the sacrifices could cleanse the conscience of the people who brought them. The old system dealt only with physical things. Uh, the priests and the people were given uh, dietary rules and uh, about what to eat and what not to eat and what to drink and what not to drink. Uh, and they were given cleansing ceremonies that could not make the person engaging in them spiritually clean. There, uh, there were uh, many laws and rules, uh, over 300 laws and rules about uh, food and ceremonies and civil and, and ceremonial laws uh, that they had, they had to observe. Now, the tabernacle and the services that the priests performed were designed to teach the Israelites um, that the way into God's presence was not open to everyone, okay? So it was exclusive. Uh, just uh, A person couldn't just willy-nilly walk up into the presence of God. And so God um, wanted them to know that only the priests could, could come in, that, that uh, you know, they're it was access, access to God was not granted to everybody. It was uh, exclusive to the, to the priests who represented the people. The Israelites could not enter into the holy place, only the courtyard. The priests were, were allowed into the holy place, but not the holy of holies. Uh, only the high priest, as I said earlier, could enter into the holy place, and that only once a year with the blood of the animals to offer for himself and, and, and all the people. Now, all these things were symbols to teach the people that access to God was restricted during the time of that old covenant, okay? So that's one of the things that, that the writer of Hebrews want to contrast with them. He wants them to see how the old covenant was and how much better the new covenant was. Under the old covenant, uh, access to God was restricted only to the priest and the high priest especially. Now the gifts and animal sacrifices were also put in place to illustrate the real sacrifice that Messiah or the Christ would make, uh, Christ Jesus would make uh, uh, when he came to earth. Now, these things were put into place until a better system could be established. Now, that better system is Christ who offered not the blood of animals, but he offered his own body as the perfect sinless sacrifice um, for our sins. And through faith in him, we have the cleansing that the old system could not bring us. Now, the old system of worship served its purpose. 
uh, and, and had to be replaced with the new covenant that Christ has brought. Now, when, when uh, Christ was crucified, at the moment of his death, that veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was torn from the top uh, to the bottom. It was supernaturally torn from top to bottom. And you can read about that in Matthew 27, chapter 27, specifically verses 51, 50 and 51. Now, this symbolized that the old system was actually being removed and, and that entrance to the, to the very presence of God had been open to all God's people, anyone who would come to, to, uh, to God through faith in Jesus Christ could come directly to God. We don't have to have a, a, a system of priests who mediate between us. Jesus is our high priest. And so we can come directly to the throne room of God. We can enter boldly, but humbly, of course, uh, into the presence of God. And, and of course, uh, that's uh, stated uh, emphatically in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Now, the majority of the Jewish people rejected their Messiah and, and, and chose to hold on to this old system uh, whose time had passed. A remnant of the Jewish people turned to Christ. Uh, the rest rejected him and held on to this old system uh, of worship that, that, was, that was meant to last only until Christ came. They wouldn't let go of it. In fact, that's why Paul, uh, the uh, writer of Hebrews is writing to these Hebrew saints because uh, they are vacillating and, and thinking about going back into the old system because they're being persecuted for walking away from it. Now, Jesus came and he perfectly obeyed the law that nobody else could obey perfectly. He obeyed it in his lifetime, the 33 years that he was upon earth, he, he obeyed it and fulfilled all of the demands of the law, okay? He obeyed the law um, perfectly, uh, the righteous demands of the law. And then he offered up his own body on the cross as a ransom to pay for our sins and to bring us forgiveness. Thus, ushering in, uh, ushering out the old covenant and ushering in the new one. But all, um, but a remnant, all except a remnant of the Jewish people held on to that old uh, system um, that God wanted to replace with the new covenant. Now, in his letter to the saints in Rome, Paul voiced his frustration over Israel's refusal to turn from this old system uh, to faith in Christ. He wrote these words, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. Well, they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. But Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. That's Romans 10 uh, and 1 through 4. So it's stated emphatically that, that they have to turn away from the old system and embrace the new system if they wanted to be right with God. But most of the Jewish people wouldn't do that. And in fact, the Hebrew saints who had done that, these that, that, that are being addressed in this letter to the Hebrews, uh, had done it and were vacillating and thinking about going back under it. And so the writer of Hebrews is trying to help them uh, out of this, this uh, uh, valley of indecision that they were in and help them to, to move in the right direction. The writer of Hebrews felt the same frustration that, that Paul felt. He's trying to convince a group of Hebrew Christians who had, they turned to Christ. Uh, they'd already uh, seen and experienced the blessings of Christ, and now they were trying to, thinking about going back under it. Now, a few years after this letter uh, of, of Hebrews was written, the Jewish temple that was the center of the, the uh, old covenant system of worship was destroyed. In 70 AD, uh, the Roman general Titus ordered his soldiers to destroy the temple, and the Jews were driven from their homeland and dispersed into all of the world. They, uh, they've not been able to practice the, the temple sacrifices and temple worship for more than 2,000 years, but most, still, uh, st uh, most of the Jewish people still haven't turned to Christ as, as their Savior and as their Redeemer. Um, however, a remnant of Jewish people 
in each generation have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I actually had the uh, pleasure of leading a Jewish woman uh, to Christ during the years when I was uh, planning uh, our church, um, uh, New Direction, which uh, at the time um, was was Charity Christian Center. I was I was uh, teaching school. I was a school teacher, and I was pastoring a church, or actually planning the church, starting the church um, uh, uh, at that time, the Charity Christian Center. Of course, we later, after my son took over the church, he renamed it New New Direction uh, Church, and he and and the church is is growing and and being blessed, but. The point is that I led this um, Jewish lady uh, to Christ, and I served as her pastor for a number of years uh, until God used her to help start a Jewish Messianic congregation right here in Indianapolis, and, and her whole family turned to Jesus or Yeshua the Messiah. Um, God worked some tremendous miracles in her life. Now, Jewish believers in Jesus, uh, the Messiah, uh, embrace the new covenant, and and uh, they, they call themselves Messianic Jews. They're called Messianic Jews, but they're believers in Christ, the Messiah. They receive him, and they embrace him. Now, that old system was only a symbol of the new, uh, a, a, a symbol of the new one. The old system contained only figures, types, and shadows of Christ, and the better covenant that he was uh, going to bring us when he came. The many ordinances of the of the old system had no impact upon the spirit, um, um, but it only dealt with the flesh. They were external laws that that did not um, move the heart or deal with the heart. Okay, they were only put in place until the time of Reformation. That is, until the time the new covenant could be uh, established that would bring Reformation and transformation. Okay, for establishing a, a it would actually establish a right relationship from the heart between sinful man and and God. Now Israel's tabernacle and its priesthood pointed to Christ, who would one day come and bring the good things that the old system prefigured and symbolized. Now I'm reading verse 11. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. Now, we Christ followers, I'm a little reluctant to say Christian uh, anymore because everything is calling itself Christian and uh, doing everything. So the word Christian has been diluted. I, perhaps I shouldn't be uh, apprehensive about using it, but it's been so abused. Uh, but we who are, are followers of Christ, believers in Christ, and those of us who follow Christ and 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 uh, 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 try to live by His teachings, we owe everything that that we enjoy to Jesus, our great High Priest. He's not ministering in some inferior temple or tabernacle on earth. He is seated in the throne room of God in heaven, at God's right hand, making intercession for us. He ministers in a far better tabernacle, the original that is in heaven, the throne room of God, okay? Um, that was uh, That is where J uh, Jesus Christ is today, and he's in the real one, the, the original, the throne room of God um, that was made by God and not by man. Now, it's real and it's tangible, but it's not a part of this natural creation that we see all around us. The writer of Hebrews Wanted to make that plain. Now I'm reading verses 12 through 13. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Now, Jesus entered the most holy place um, that is in heaven with his own blood. Okay, his own superior, perfect, sinless blood, and not the inferior blood of goats and calves. He he did not um, have to do it more than once. One time was enough to secure our redemption forever. Now the word redemption means the action of saving or or being saved from sin or error or evil. Okay, that's one definition. And another uh, definition that is um, equally relevant is 
Redemption is the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or cleansing a debt. So Jesus saved those who turned to him in faith uh, with his own body and his own blood. He paid the ransom and regained possession of lost humanity uh, and cleared our debt of sin. Okay, so we were lost because of what Adam and Eve did. They sold us under sin. And so God had to redeem us. He had to repossess us. He had to buy us back. And the price of our salvation and our redemption was the precious sinless blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Now that old system used the blood of animals and the ashes of a heifer in ceremonial washings. The ashes of a heifer were left after the, the heifer was uh, offered as a, a burnt offering. Of course, a heifer is a, a cow, kind of a reddish uh, cow that they would, uh, uh, or bull that they would uh, actually offer up. They'd kill it, burn it, and then they would take the ashes of that and use it. Uh, the ashes were collected by the priest and they were used to sprinkle in the water uh, in the labor uh, that's, that's outside the tabernacle. And this water with the ashes was used in ceremonial washings and cleansing. It was, it was a sort of holy water, if you will. And you can read about that in Numbers 19 and 1 through 3. Now, these washings um, only provided a ceremonial cleansing of the body. It was only a temporary covering of sin. These ceremonies were symbolic cleansings that actually uh, only stood for or represented the coming Christ who would bring true and permanent cleansing from sin to us. Now I'm reading verses 14 through 15. Yes, think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people, so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under the first covenant. Now, if the blood of animals uh, provided a temporary covering uh, of people's sins, that, uh, they, uh, and, and that covering of, of, that was provided by the animals, the temporary covering, it was acceptable to God under that old system. Now, if it was effective under the old system, imagine how much more the uh, potent and powerful and effective blood of Jesus Christ uh, is for bringing us our permanent eternal redemption. The animal sacrifices could not provide the, the permanent solution or eternal redemption, but Jesus Christ is the only one who could. He is the only one who can mediate this new and better covenant between God and people, and he has mediated that covenant, and uh, we only have to enter into it by placing our faith in him. Now, the writer makes the important point that Jesus did his work of redemption in offering a perfect sacrifice through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Christ died to free the Jewish people who were under the old covenant and then and also all of us Gentiles who were far away from God. He, he, he freed us all from our sins um, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, everyone that God has called receive the eternal inheritance that Jesus Christ has promised us and gives us, and we receive the benefits of this a better covenant that he has established. Now, during the season of the old covenant, when the Jews who were uh, under law offered their animal sacrifices for their sin, God would temporarily pardon their sins or give them credit for their sins until the time that Christ would come to pay the full penalty or the full price for our sins. Figuratively speaking, the animal sacrifices were like a kind of IOU uh, for sin that God accepted under the old system, knowing that Jesus was going to come and pay it with his own blood when he came. Now, the work that Jesus did made it possible for our consciences to be purified or cleansed from sinful deeds or dead works. That, uh, that brings about death. Uh, the sacrifice of Christ prepares and helps us to serve the living God. And, and, and sinful deeds or dead works to these Hebrew saints um, also included their turning back to 
of the law. The law of Moses uh, was no longer effective in bringing about uh, forgiveness of sin and cleansing. So that system had served its purpose and was no longer valid. And so if the Hebrew people went back under it, then, then everything that they did under it, God rejected as dead works. Now, since Christ had come, and shed his own blood to redeem us and make us right. Any attempt to approach God through that old system of worship um, was rejected. God would not, would not accept it. He would reject it as dead works because it was a rejection uh, of the system that he has put in place to save us and a rejection of his own son. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for the redemption and the forgiveness of our sins or the sins of everyone who will Turn to him in faith. And I know I, I'm saying that a lot, but I'm saying it because it's important. It's, it's the gateway into life. To, to turn to Jesus Christ in faith is the gateway into eternal life. So it's important for me to reiterate that almost to the point of redundancy. If I keep saying and saying again, you understand I'm saying it because it's so important. It was for the Gentiles who never, under the law, um, had, who had sinned and who were never under the law. So God's a sacrifice of, a, of his son saved us, the Gentiles who were far away, but it also uh, was, was given and served to serve the Jewish people who were under the law but couldn't keep the law. Now I'm reading verses 16 through 22. Now when someone leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the, the will cannot be put into effect. That is why even the most uh, the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses had reached had read each of the of God's commandments to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled both the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop branches and scarlet wool. Then he said, "This blood confirmed the covenant God has made with you." And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, the writer uses the legal process for executing um, a last will and testament as an illustration of how the new covenant uh, was executed and put into force. A person who leaves a will has to die before it can be put into force. Uh, and the wishes of the deceased person can only be carried out um, uh, for the beneficiary, beneficiaries after the person has died. Both the old covenant and the new covenant are like a will that a person writes out detailing the benefits that the dead person wants to leave to the surviving loved ones. Okay, The old covenant was executed with the death of animals instead of people. Animals substituted for people. The bulls and the goats that the priest sacrificed provided the death that substituted for the death of the person who would normally uh, die before a will is put into force. Now, then Moses read all the rules and regulations and provisions of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant to the people. Then in a ceremony, Moses mixed the blood of these sacrificed animals with water, and he used a, a scarlet wool and hyssop to sprinkle the, the book of the law that he had read from, and he sprinkled the people saying um, these words. These are the words he said. This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then he sprinkled the tabernacle and all the vessels and all the instruments used in worship. Okay, So God had instructed Moses and the priests to purify almost everything with blood. And, and, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. Now, Neither the old covenant or the new covenant could be put into effect without death, without blood. Without the shedding of blood, again, there is no remission. Now, this is a principle that uh, was first seen when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. God killed two animals and took their skins to cover the nakedness and, and shame of these first two sinners. Um, now, this was symbolic of the blood that would be required to cover the nakedness of uh, uh, of our sin, first under the old covenant with the blood of animal sacrifices, then with the blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, uh, the permanent atonement and cleansing for humanity's sins. The death of these animals and their blood was used to symbolize Christ 
who would come and die and shed his own blood uh, for us uh, to redeem us and cleanse us. Now, just as an animal had to die uh, before the old covenant could be established, Jesus had to die before his will and new testament or new covenant could take effect. He died to put his new covenant into effect, and he rose again to, to execute the provisions of his will, the new covenant, now which Christians now enjoy and benefit from. We are under this new covenant. But the best promises of the new covenant will, uh, will be given to us when Jesus Christ comes to earth again. Now I'm reading verses 23 through 28. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it which were copies of things in heaven had to be purified by the blood of animal. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animal. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth, who entered the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal, uh, if that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ has offered once for all times as a sacrifice. Uh, Christ, so Christ was offered once for all times as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sin, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Now, the writer of Hebrews reminds the Hebrew saints and us that the tabernacle and its furnishings and instruments for worship were only a copy. Again, he says, only a copy of the real ones that exist in heaven. And since they are only copies, um, it is acceptable to God that they could uh, be purified by the ones on earth. But the real temple and its furnishings that are in heaven had to be purified with a, with a better sacrifice than the blood of animals. They had to be purified with the perfect sinless blood of Christ. Now, of course, the things in heaven did not need purif purification from defilement but uh, possibly to be dedicated or set apart by the blood of Christ. Now, the priests offered their sacrifices in the imita imitation tabernacle, if you will, um, the one that was made by human hands that existed here on earth. Jesus didn't go into that earthly tabernacle. He went into the one in heaven, right into the throne room of God uh, to, uh, to present his blood before God. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, with its golden cover, served as God's throne or mercy seat in the tabernacle on earth. But Jesus went before God's throne in heaven, in the presence uh, of God to present his blood. He didn't have to offer up his body and, and blood over and over and over again as the priest did, but he did it one time and that was enough. Now, in verse 26, the writer of Hebrews said, Jesus appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice, meaning that the end of the age began when, when Jesus came to earth. The end of the age has been unwinding uh, since that time, uh, the time that Jesus walked this earth in a human body 2,000 years ago. Now I believe that we're living at the very end of the end of the age or the last of the last days. I believe we stand on the very brink of the end of the age. Uh, and I believe that we uh, stand on the, on, on, on the coming, the near coming of Christ. For more than 2,000 years, the blood of Christ, the, the perfect sacrifice, has been cleansing people from their sins, all those who come to him and put their faith in him. Now, in verse 27, the writer reminds us that each person is appointed or destined to die once. And after... Uh, after they die, their fate is sealed. They have no more opportunities to change their destiny. They are set for the judgment. The point is that as surely as each person must die one time and after death, they have to face judgment. So also Christ was offered one time 
for everyone. And he sacrificed himself one time to take away the, the sins of the people. Christ paid for the sins of every human being. No one has to pay for their own sins. If they turn to Christ before they die, no one has to be uh, to fall under the judgment for their own sin. Nobody gets a second chance after death. The way um, that you die is, is the way that you will spend eternity, either with Christ or apart from Christ. Now, I should note that there are two people who never did die, Enoch and Elijah. They were both carried into heaven alive. It's also important for me to note that uh, there will be a whole generation of, of, of Christ followers, those who believe in and follow Christ, uh, who will not die, but be taken to heaven. They will be raptured away in the church, with the church when Jesus Christ comes. And you can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and, and uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, the writer of Hebrews ends this chapter with the words of great hope for those who believe in and trust in Christ. He will come again, not to deal with our sins. He did that the first time. Um, he's coming back to bring salvation to all of us who eagerly await his, his coming. Now, if Christians really knew or really understand uh, what's in store for us when Jesus returns, we will be eagerly awaiting his coming. Uh, we'll be praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Uh, we'll be praying, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, okay? Um, so if we knew all that uh, God has in store for us. So to help you out, let me share with you a little bit about what uh, the salvation that Jesus Christ is going to bring with him. Uh, number one, he's going to bring uh, perfect, sinless, glorified bodies for us. We'll be transformed and, and given a new body. Number two, inheritance and ownership of the whole earth. We will rule and reign with him. Number three, restoration of the earth to, to the paradise that it was before the fall. Number four, absolute peace on earth, even among the animals. Number five, freedom from sin, sickness, and death. Number six, he will appoint us to rule and reign over the entire earth with him. And number seven, he will give us, bring to us, everlasting life. We'll never get sick, never grow old, and never die. And so I say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Well, that brings us to the end of Hebrews chapter 9. Next time, we'll cover chapter 10. I want to invite you to uh, tune into our services at New Direction Church, where my son is the pastor, and he's doing a great job. Kenneth Sullivan Jr. is the senior pastor. And of course, during the, uh, the uh, COVID um pandemic, we are live streaming our services uh, Sunday mornings at 8.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. And you can find us at ndcbetterlife.org. Please join us for any or all of these services. And now until next time, may God bless you and keep you safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for tuning in to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. We hope this program has benefited you in your Christian walk. For a free download of this program and to browse Dr. Sullivan's books, videos, and audio titles, visit our website at EmergeCurriculum.com.